So in this video, we're going to continue our discussion of data management. In the first two stages, we assumed, uh, first few stages, we, we came up with our, our plan. In the second stage, we came up, we actually did the data collection. So we've planned, we've done the data collection. Now we're going to move on to the next few stages, which are really kind of the core, the, the management of the data by the team that produced it. And so once we've collected data, the next step really focuses on, on data assurance. And so this is where our, kind of our classic quality assurance and quality control comes in, QAQC. And QAQC usually uh, will take the form, uh, for, for small data sets, you can do this by hand, but increasingly, as we deal with the larger and larger data sets, we need to be able to do that QAQC uh, through semi-automated processes, and that will often include uh, calculating statistics, looking at graphs, and really trying to identify uh, what are outliers, what are impossible values, what are invalid values, and again, you know, all of this is really uh, assisted if you agree uh, at the time the data is being collected as part of the planning process on what, that, what the ranges of valid uh, data are, what the acceptable uh, values on text data can be, or, you know, acceptable codes and stuff like that. It makes it a lot easier uh, to do that kind of QAQC if you kind of define that ahead of time. Another thing that's really useful as part of QAQC is, is the use of quality flags. And so this is the idea that uh, rather than um, you know, deleting data that is suspect or uh, you know, manipulating data uh, that, that is possibly invalid, uh, but you instead have a, a parallel column to the, the original data column, which stores uh, information about data quality. It might be something as simple as you know, use, don't use, or it could be a, a more complex system that records you know, uh, nuances about why the data might be suspect. Or so like in remote sensing, you might have quality control flags that tell you things about you know, possible cloud cover or possible shadow effects or you know, a whole range of different things that are, are related to you know, you know, why the data may or may not be used because you know, the, the, the usability of data may be actually context dependent. Something that is uh, too, too noisy for one person might actually uh, be just fine for another application that requires lower precision. Um, at this stage, you might also need to do some sort of uh, gap filling uh, of missing values. And, and any sort of uh, estimated values in a data set need to be, again, clearly flagged with a QAQC flag to indicate this was not actually raw data, but some sort of filled in uh, data, you know, interpolated or, or just inferred uh, through some other process or, or filled in through some other data stream. So you need to be very clear in any data set, what were the actual original raw measurements and what were, was any sort of corrected measurement or inferred measurement or, or filled in measurement. Um, and again, uh, the important part of, an important part of all data management is, is provenance. So you need to be able to track back uh, who did any sort of data quality checking and when it was done. Uh, one of the things that my lab did, does with any time it's doing field work that really helps a lot with QAQC is that uh, an independent person actually does the first stage of QAQC uh, that same day after we get back from the field. Well, everything is fresh in our minds so that if there is any question about the data, usually you can still recollect uh, what you had done. And, and if uh, you need to go back and, and redo something or check on something, it's usually quite easy to do that first thing the next day. And much harder to, if you're doing this months later. Okay, so let's assume we've uh, done our QAQC and our data is passed. Um, before we do any sort of archiving of data, it's also really important to have that data well documented. And so this is usually what takes on the form of what's called metadata, data about our data. And so metadata will describe things like how the internal organization of files and their formats, the, ex the, the larger organization of files in terms of their file names and directory structures. Um, that's kind of the obvious part of metadata, but some of the less obvious things are the need to describe the methods that were used when the data was collected. Uh, information that helps us understand the scientific context of the data, uh, that helps us understand a lot about whether it can be reused for a different context and you know, the original reason the data was collected. 
uh, it's also important to, to have a record, again, of, of who, uh, who collected the data, who described the data, who did the QAQC, that should be part of the metadata that, that uh, again, it's called provenance, this kind of cookie trail, breadcrumb trail of, of the steps of, of who did what at different stages. Uh, there's a wide range of tools out there to help us with this description, and some, there, some of this will be things like uh, standards for metadata across different communities. So as an ecologist, a, a lot of the data I work with follow the, the eco ecological metadata language, EML. Uh, there's Udenata standards that we use for some other things. There's ISO standards we use for other things. There's different metadata standards out there, and you're, you're always encouraged to use an existing standard rather than make something up, because that makes it a lot easier uh, for other people to use that data and interpret the data. And a lot of thought have often gone into the planning of those metadata, so the fields that exist are, are often well thought out. Uh, these other two things, NetCDF and HDF, are examples of uh, file formats that are more sophisticated than things like Excel spreadsheets um, that are actually designed to be self-documenting. So the files themselves will not store not just the data, but the units and the descriptions of the variable names and things about them uh, are, are internally stored within the files. And that actually makes it much more portable uh, than files where you have the data in one file and the metadata in another, and they, they potentially could get separated. Uh, where possible, uh, anytime they exist in a community, you should be strongly encouraged to use any data standards that exist, because data standards, as we say here, are, are documented agreements on the representation, format, definition, structure, tagging, transmission, manipulation, use, and management of data. So basically, they're when a community comes together for a certain type of data and agree on how that data should be stored and managed, what variable names mean, what units are used, and it allows much greater uh, interoperability of data and much greater transparency over you know, making something up yourself. So this, this example here is the, the uh, example of variable names from the, the CF standard, the climate forecast standard, which is used uh, by a number of different parts of envir environmental sciences, particularly atmospheric sciences. Um, so we've, we got, we did our QAQC, we did our, our metadata, uh, the next step is to make sure that we are, are preserving the data, that we have a plan uh, for what we're doing with this. And, and an important part of data preservation is that, that whenever possible, and it's not always possible, whenever possible, data should be publicly archived. Uh, it's been shown that, that data that is not publicly archived becomes unavailable very quickly. You know, you know, one estimate is a half light of, of 18 months, so that you know, the idea there being that any data that's not publicly archived, if you try to you know, contact the team that generated it, you know, after 18 months, half of them either won't respond to you or they, they'll respond to you, but they won't be able to find the original data or the original files. And that you know, as time passes, the data, your ability to recover data drops off you know, exponentially. Um, so data that are years old are virtually impossible to track back down, even if you know, a publication that says you know, available upon request um, so something that's a persistent archive is a much more reliable place to put data. Um, and I think it's important, you know, increasingly recognize that, you know, the output of any sort of research activity or data collection activity isn't the publication that comes from that, but the data as well. And if the data didn't exist, you know, what, that are, what are good are the results if no one can go back and verify them? So how do we preserve things? Uh, so one thing you need to think about is where is the data going? You know, what data center is being used? There's a lot of different uh, things out there uh, in different communities, and some of them uh, are truly persistent archives, and some of them are, are things that look like they're data stores, but actually make it very easy for people to go back in and delete data or change data that, such that the data that's in the, the, the preserved data is not immutable. So the best data centers are ones that you know, they allow you to potentially update new versions and deposit new versions, but they never actually delete or manipulate the old versions. Um, data preservation should be clear about what the policies are associated with that data so that someone who goes to use that data later knows what is and is not allowed. So are the, what are the rules on, on reuse for research purposes, reuse for commercial purposes, the need to contact the original authors or, or data producers and uh, you know, requirements for acknowledgement and in general I think the community is moving more and more towards you know, open policies where data is 
is available. You know, one thing that's really clear uh, in terms of the research side is almost all the research that is done in our community is done uh, using government funding, and, and really that data belongs to you know, the country and the people in it because it was purchased using you know, tax dollars from our own country. Um, and so that data belongs to the, you know, someone who collects data may often feel like it's their data, but it really was collected using public funding. So again, what, what licenses are appro appropriate for different types of data? And then how do you handle truly private data? I mean, there are data that, that shouldn't be public. So medical record data should not be uh, made public. A lot of other human research, subject research data has privacy requirements. And other things like endangered species data has privacy requirements. You know, you can't, there wouldn't be uh, spotted owls around very long if you took the maps of all the locations that are nests and you put it out on the internet. Uh, very quickly, folks would then find the folks who are not interested in the preservation of that species would find all the nests. Um, attribution and citation. So, what is how should this data be cited if someone uses it? And again, that provenance. So, how uh, what is that record keeping of who did what? Cool. So, so this kind of wraps up the the bit of this lecture on on data quality control and management and preservation, and kind of wraps up things from the the data producer's perspective, in the next video, we're going to kind of look at things uh, from the, the next stages of the, the data lifecycle, which are really from the data consumer's perspective.